Today I'm talking to Dr. Tim Littlewood, consultant haematologist in Oxford, and Dr. Duncan Bryan, an ST6 haematology trainee in North West London. So Tim, why did you choose haematology as your specialty? Well, in fact, um, uh, I was training um, with the intention of becoming a chess physician because I'd really enjoyed chess medicine as a medical student. I'd done a post in chess medicine as a SHO, junior doctor, which I'd really enjoyed. And then having got past the membership exam of this college, um, I worked as a medical registrar for a year. And then I got offered the chance to do a research post um, looking at clinical and laboratory aspects of patients with small cell lung cancer, because I thought this would be useful if I was going to be a chess doctor. And a number of things happened to me doing that, during that um, time in research, of which two were the most important. The first is that I was um, fascinated and, if you like, enthused by my contact with the patients themselves who had lung cancer. And secondly, my major supervisor for the research happened to be a haematologist. And um, he was young, very dynamic, and quite often at the beginning of the day, um, if we got there early, he would say to me, um, I've been asked to come and see a go and see a patient on the ward. Why don't you come with me? And I would. I'd follow him and he would go and see the patient, take the history, examine them, maybe take a blood sample from them and sometimes a bone marrow test. And then at the end of the day, you'd say to me, come and look at this under the microscope. This is what's wrong with the patient. And then he, I would go with him when he went back to the patient as he explained the diagnosis and treatment to the patient. And at the time, and to this day, I thought this was the definition of being a complete doctor, taking the physical, the, the, the history, the examination, and then doing the, labo the laboratory bit all on your own, and then going back to the patient. I thought this was a wonderful integration of both clinical and laboratory skills. And so instead of becoming a chest doctor, I became a haematologist. Okay, so that was my excuse, Duncan. What was yours? A good question, Tim, but I think I can relate to some of your story. Um, I started with chest medicine as well, and, um, but I think, I think probably I had the interest before that time because at medical school we had teaching um, with blood film examination and I just thought this was a fascinating way in that I would be looking in the blood film for the same sort of signs and symptoms that I look for when I'm examining a patient now. And I think this really appealed because um, it was pretty neat how you could perhaps make the diagnosis sometimes by looking down the microscope as long as you'd taken appropriate um, history. Um, but I think I also wanted to look after patients with um, you know, chronic conditions in that I, I wanted to know my patients and, uh, and I still see patients that I've met several years ago who remember me and I remember them and I think that's one of the most rewarding aspects of the, the job. Um, I was interested in um, pathology as well because I didn't understand it at um, medical school but I had the opportunity to take an extra year in um, intercalated BSc and I just thought um, clinical haematology was what would allow me to um, explore the pathology of my patients in enough detail to make a diagnosis that actually um, I could be in charge of um, that management and the diagnostic process and that was extremely rewarding um, when I experienced it. Yeah. And one of the things I um, mentioned was that I looked after patients with small cell lung cancer and they really um, made me want to um, look after people with malignant disease in the future. And there were a number of reasons for that. One was their, um, if you like, acceptance of their diagnosis but also it was they taught me actually and their families taught me a lesson that I've tried not to forget which is to you if you like the illness is the thing that's what you're there to diagnose and treat and to them the illness of course is a very important thing that's happening to them but it's just one part of their lives and they have um, partners they have work they have children um, who are all involved um, in this because it's disrupted the family. And I realised talking to them that they wanted, of course, the best care, the most appropriate care, um, but they also understood that you couldn't do the impossible for them 
And in the end, they wanted honesty. They wanted you to tell them what was realistic and what wasn't realistic um, for them. And I learned an enormous amount from that group of patients. And uh, um, I've tried to um, uh, never forget, if you like, that learning. Because in haematology, we treat a lot of patients with serious, indeed, life-threatening diseases. And the skills, if you like, those patients taught me 30 years ago, I try and still apply today. I wonder whether, Tim, you might say a bit about um, what you think the challenges are that face your specialty or the things that might put people off from coming into your specialty. Well, we've talked um, quite a lot, actually, about the sort of clinical aspects of what we do. But one thing we haven't touched on very much um, is the laboratory aspect of haematology. And I'm in to mention that because it is one of the challenges. But it's one of the... Um, aspects of haematology that I love the most. Um, and Duncan talked a little bit about this earlier on. Um, haematologists have to be diagnosticians. I see patients referred to my new patient clinic simply because they've got abnormalities of their full blood count. But the underlying disease causing the abnormality of the full blood count often isn't a haematological disorder. It may be chronic liver disease or chronic kidney disease. It could be an infection such as tuberculosis or endocarditis, HIV. It could be an underlying solid tumour that's causing the problems. So as a haematologist, I'm not just di diagnosing haematological illnesses, but I'm having to um, uh, um, keep my knowledge broad-based so I can diagnose this wide range of other diseases that happen to present with a haematological abnormality. One of the great challenges we're facing in the UK is whether haematologists of the future should continue to have laboratory-based training in addition to a clinical training, or whether we should begin to follow what already happens in the USA and many parts of mainland Europe, where haematologists are trained either in laboratory techniques and diagnosis or in clinical haematology, but not both. My personal view is I think it's a great strength of our training that haematologists um, are trained in um, both disciplines, if you like, both aspects of the work, even though eventually some will focus more in one area than another as consultants. And that brings me, I think, a bit onto what you might think about shape of training and what you might think about the push that all people who have membership of the Royal College of Physicians should uh, get involved with a general medical take at some point, and I wonder what either of you might think about that, perhaps starting with you, um, Duncan. Well, I think that um, perhaps one of the ideas that is expressed in Shape of Training may be to lengthen core medical training, and I, um, I'm, I don't think that's a bad thing. If you have a longer attachment to a specialty, then you perhaps get more involved in it, and if you have more subspecialties you ex you're exposed to during that time, perhaps you have an even broader skill set when you finish uh, core medical training. Um, I think that's equipped me fairly well to deal with the general medical problems that I see in my haematology patients. Um, whether my um, time spent in specialty training thereafter would be um, degraded by having to attend to a take, I, I, I fear it would be the case because um, we are um, Treatments in haematology is changing all the time. Um, clinical trials, which were being uh, envisaged or started um, a year or two ago, are now the mainstream for treatment. And so I think to keep up with changing treatment, diagnostic techniques in haematology compared to other me medical specialties is particularly challenging, but equally exciting. But I'm not sure how much room it leaves for haematology specialist trainees to participate in general medical on call. So uh, perhaps if we could um, finish off with, with a final question, um, and I think I'll address that to you first, Tim. Why do you think it's important to expose students and trainees to haematology? Well, there are two answers um, uh, that I have to that question. Um, many students and junior doctors find haematology difficult. We did a survey, actually, about five or six years ago um, of Oxford, finally a medical students and they didn't know it was a survey about their haematology knowledge or understanding because we covered a wide number of medical specialties 
But what we discovered was that they had most anxiety and lack of certainty about their knowledge of haematology compared to any of the other specialties. And that's partly our fault because we use sometimes difficult language when we're reporting blood films and we should make it much less technical. So there's certainly, a, 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 I think, a, I would say necessarily a fear. We termed it hematophobia, by the way, but um, uh, it's certainly a, a, an uncertainty of their knowledge um, at medical student level and amongst junior doctors. And on that, um, on that background, we have to remember that a full blood count is probably the commonest pathology test that's requested. In the laboratory in Oxford, we do between 1,500 and 2,000 full blood counts a day. Junior doctors, hospitals, specialists of all sorts, general practitioners are having to interpret the results of those full blood counts. So I think it's quite important that they have at least a basic knowledge and understanding of how to do that. And the only way they're going to get that basic knowledge and understanding is if we teach it to them in simple, understandable language whilst they're medical students and junior doctors. And the second thing is, if we are trying to um, uh, encourage people, if that's the right word, into your specialty, um, I strongly believe you don't encourage people into your specialty by saying you should be a haematologist, young man. I think people get inspired and enthused in, uh, about a subject by watching um, consultants, um, trainees in the specialty and seeing how they function seeing whether they appear to enjoy what they're doing. Are they um, um, showing enthusiasm for their specialty? But unless they're exposed to the specialty, they, they are unlikely to see that. So I'm a, um, I do believe very strongly that all medical students should be able to have some exposure to all specialties, but certainly, of course, haematology. Um, and um, it's our job as haematologists to provide them in those opportunities with appropriate training and education, making it understandable, simplifying what can be quite a complex subject, and helping them to, um, to understand it. Yeah, I mean, I think um, when, when I've had medical students, um, which isn't all that often, and, and a haematology attachment, which is a shame, but um, they, they, they really, seem to thoroughly enjoy it. They gave us, you know, they baked us uh, a thank you cake in the shape of some blood cells. They gave us a card. And I was amazed about perhaps students who were fairly disinterested or dismissive of perhaps the, this maybe boring or, or somehow difficult subject. You know, when, when actually we broke it down with them, um, they were really enthusiastic. I don't know if any of them have gone on to be haematologists yet, but I look at my own... Um, Path, and I remember the fact that I was able to participate in outpatient clinics in haematology. And those, even though they were brief opportunities, I think they're very important to actually uh, give me a taste of, of the specialty.